Welcome. We're so glad that you're able to join with us today at Oak Bend Church. we just like to start off with a few quick announcements. Um, in case you've been wondering, the parking lot is going to be replaced here very soon, so that project is going to be underway um, starting as early as sometime next week. Uh, it'll last approximately four weeks. We'll still be able to use the parking lot. They're kind of doing it in phases, so don't worry too much about that. We've got it handled on that end, so you should still be able to park in the parking lot, and then hopefully a month from now, you'll be parking on a new parking lot. It'll be, it'll be nice. So um, thank you for your faithful giving towards the building fund, and that's part of it. Um, we're just excited for that to happen. So uh, I want to especially thank Mike Trinity for seeing it through. Um, yeah. He's going to chastise me after service for calling him out, so that's, that's fine. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of people involved, a lot of things to go around, but he's kind of seen it through the end. So, Also, uh, church potluck, after church on Sunday, April 30th, um, we still need some volunteers to sign up and bring food. There was a Sign Up Genius email uh, that was sent out, so check your email for that, and it'll show you where you can sign up and uh, pick something to bring. We'd love to see you there. That'll be after church on Sunday, April 30th. And then we don't have a slide for this, but I wanted to uh, just remind you that we do have a rummage sale coming up. So if you still have some things that you're looking to, to uh, get rid of that would be helpful, uh, usable to sell for a very reasonable price to somebody who's looking for something, then bring that. Um, on Sunday the 30th, Monday the 1st, like all day, I'll be here collecting stuff. So you want to come during you know, normal working hours, I'll be in the lobby. Just uh, feel free to bring stuff on by and we'll be getting that all squared away. Also, uh, Barb went ahead and set up a, it's on the cork board back there, there's a little sign-up sheet to the right that basically, we need some help with sorting and organizing and pricing. So if that is your thing, and it's not my thing, but maybe it's somebody's, then uh, Barb would love some help with that. And you can sign up, there's time slots, she's got it very, very organized, she's, she's put a lot of thought and energy into this, uh, a lot of thought and energy into this whole, whole process. So um, we'd love for you to be a part of it to help serve. Um, kind of with the pre-rummage sale stuff, and there's some opportunities to serve uh, on the 5th and 6th when we do have the rummage sale as well. So we'd love to see you get involved, and we'd love your stuff as well, and uh, the money will go towards um, trips that we'll be able to take as a youth ministry. So if you have stuff that you're looking to get rid of, bring it on the 30th or the 1st, and we would love to, to uh, sell your stuff for you and, and support some missions work. So uh, all that said, would you stand with me? Let's pray and praise our great God. Heavenly Father, we join together, uh, unified as a local church body, but really unified as we think around the globe of all the churches gathered, whether they met last night or early this morning or, or this evening, any hour of the day, that we're, we're not alone. We're not just, just this little church in Perrysburg, Ohio all by ourselves. We're connected, not just to even a denomination, but to a global church of believers with undivided loyalty to the one true king. Thank you so much, Lord, for that honor and for having a family to, to care for us, to love us, and to worship together, uh, unified in you. Father, thank you for your son, whom we celebrated uh, for uh, the forgiveness of sins last week, a wonderful Easter service and bringing the family back together. We pray uh, that you worked on hearts and you're continuing to do so to bring people back into the family, that they would be called children of God, that they would call upon the name of the Most High God. And thank you that we get to do that this morning together. In Jesus' name, amen. Come set your rule and reign our hearts again increase in us we pray unveil why we're made come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls holy spirit come invade us now your church, we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, we refuse to waste our lives. 
the presence of the living God breathe like only you can breathe. Come and fill this room, anything apart from That's our prayer this morning, Father. Let it fall away. So all that's left is you. That we bring everything that we've been carrying and leave it at your feet, Lord. Everything in our hearts that's not of you, that it falls away. And you fill that void, Father. Jesus, there is nothing in this world that can take your place. So let it all fall away. Let it be replaced by your love, the hope that we have in you, the joy and the gladness that comes from knowing you as a savior, redeemer, counselor, Let the world just fall away as we sit in your presence this morning, Lord. What a wonderful gift to be able to come and be with you this morning.
as a family, as your children, Lord. As we, Lord, get ready to send our children upstairs, I pray that you don't stop moving, Father, that you continue to bless this whole place, Lord, with your your presence and that your spirit would move through the teachers and through the kids, Lord. There are so many times when we learn from their innocence and their simple way of looking at you, Lord. So I pray that you help us and them, Lord, continue to learn and sit at your feet this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Well, good morning, church. So good to be with you today and be together. Uh, Last week, we had a great Easter Sunday, beautiful day, and uh, this morning again together. uh, We're going to return to the book of Daniel, where we have uh, probably been for maybe about 10 weeks. We're going to finish it up in probably the next four. Lord willing, we're going to finish it up in the next four. Uh, and things, but this morning uh, we're going to be in Daniel chapter nine. So, if you've got a Bible or whatever it is you look at your Bible on, could I encourage you to take that out and uh, turn there, and we'll begin to look at that in just a few moments. Uh, if you've ever pursued uh, some type, probably of higher education, it's uh, probably a good possibility that at the end of your program, you've had to do something that is often referred to as a final project. Uh, When I was in seminary and my time ended, I had to do a final project. In this case, it turned out to be a really long paper on a given subject, which I then had to, at least with my advisor, defend and be able to talk through. Um, This week, I came across what at least for me, the most unique final project I've ever heard about, done by this lady right here. This lady's name is Judy Peterson. She uh, finished her time in a seminary in Illinois, preparing for ministry. And um, as her time came to an end, she decided if she was really going to minister uh, for Christ uh, to people, then she needed to have some time away from merely books and spend some real time with Jesus. Uh, You can spend a lot of time learning about Jesus and yet not really connect with Jesus. Uh, We heard that in seminary over and over. One of my professors said, it'll take you four years to get through it and eight years to get over it. I had no idea what he meant by that. I figured that out now, but I didn't then. It's true. You can learn a lot about him and not know him. And uh, so she decided, I really need to know him, and I need to experience Jesus providing for me personally, because that's what people need in their daily lives. And so she thought, how in the world will I ever accomplish that? She said, I prayed about it, and I came up with my final project. She went to her advisor and said, for my final project, what I'd like to do is I would like to take a walk across America. And I would just like to walk, and whoever I, God puts in my path, I meet. And uh, some of the things that I'm sure I'm going to need that I can't even prepare for now, I want to see him provide that. And she decided she would start from the Pacific Ocean, walk all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, a journey of a little over 4,000 miles, And she did, and if memory serves me right, she accomplished it in 396 days. Uh, She has now been dubbed the walking preacher, and uh, she actually has a podcast and things of that sort. 
But reading her story, she talked about while she prepared for the things physically that she knew she would need for that journey, she said, as I took it, I realized that God, through this project, revealed to me things that I would always need for my spiritual journey, and they've now become a part of my life. I thought of her story when I think of Daniel chapter 9 this morning, because that to me is in a sense what Daniel chapter 9 is about. It is a reminder of some of the things that we need to walk our spiritual journey well. And we're going to think about a couple of those this morning. Uh, When you come to Daniel 9, uh, we're in the prophetic section of Daniel. And Daniel, uh, at least here, is toward the end of his physical journey and his spiritual journey. Uh, Notice how verse 1 begins of chapter 9. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom. Now, if you've been here through this series, you know that Daniel, we watched him serve a succession of kings and kingdoms. Daniel arrived in Babylon as a young man under the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, who ruled for several decades. He passes off the scene. When you come to Daniel chapter 5, you meet a king called Belshazzar, most likely uh, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. He will rule for another 15, 20 years, and he passes off the scene in a single night. That's recorded for us in Daniel 5. When the Medes and the Persians come in, they conquer Babylon, and this guy right here, Darius, is installed as the king. And he will be the last king and the last kingdom under which Daniel will serve. Uh, By the time we get to this chapter, Daniel has probably been in Babylon about 60 years. So depending on the age he arrives, which most people think is anywhere between about the age of 14 uh, to about 21, uh, put those numbers together, and, and Daniel is somewhere mid-70s, maybe into his 80s. He's on the end of things for him physically and even in his spiritual journey. And yet, as we've seen together uh, and we've looked at his life, this guy has had a lot of ups and a lot of downs. He's went through a lot of trials He's been put under a lot of pressure to conform to the ways of things in the place that he's living. And the truth is, there were probably times it seemed easier, it would have been easier, uh, at least humanly speaking, and wiser to just kind of give in and not be so different sometimes. And yet, that's not how Daniel lived his life. And Daniel is a picture of somebody remaining faithful to God and incredibly hopeful when times are tough. And I believe chapter 9 gives us some reasons why Daniel was that kind of an individual and how you and I can be that same kind of a person. Now, a little bit about Daniel 9. Uh, Daniel 9 contains uh, one of the most incredible prayers you'll find anywhere in the Bible. It's also one of the longest prayers that you're going to find anywhere in the Bible. And then it contains probably what is the most contested, uh, argued about, debated about, prophetic passage, maybe found anywhere in the Bible. And uh, I have it all now figured out, so you'll be... (laughs) I don't. I am under no illusions this morning that uh, I'm going to be able to totally unpack that Uh, But we're going to try to walk through it together, and hopefully we'll learn something. And at the end, what I think we need to see is the bigger pictures that's here about what we need to learn for our lives. So we're going to think this morning about a couple reminders for the journey. And here's where Daniel starts, and we're going to start at least in chapter 9, is there is a reminder here that we need to follow the map. Uh, When you go on a journey... Uh, If you're wise, if you're wise, you will take a map, or at least today we probably would say you'll use your GPS, Uh, but you're going to use something by which to chart your course uh, to warn you of 
possible dangers, obstacles, let you know the best routes to take, and let you know the dead ends that you would probably be wise to avoid. When chapter 9 opens up, that is exactly what Daniel is doing. He is consulting his map. Look again, verse 1 and 2. It says, In the first year of Darius, son of Xerxes, a Mede by descent, who was made ruler over the Babylonian kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the scriptures, according to the word of the Lord given to Jeremiah the prophet, that the desolation of, Jer- of Jerusalem would last 70 years. Take note what Daniel's map is. It is the Bible. In this case, Daniel's Bible is the Old Testament, and particularly the book he has come to is the book of Jeremiah, the one that you have and I have in our Bibles. Now, the way that this is written, notice it says, I, Daniel, understood from the Scriptures. The way that is written is meant to be a reminder to us that this has been and still is a regular part of Daniel's life. That is, Daniel spends regular time combing through the Scriptures, moving through the Old Testament on a regular basis. He does not just reach for it when life kind of falls out from under him. Now, if you've been here, you will know that when we were in Daniel chapter 7 and 8, uh, there is some history there about uh, what's going to happen to Israel. Now, from our perspective, it's already happened. From Daniel's, it was still future. And it was a history that um, was somewhat ominous. And uh, it, things did not look good for them. And so when you get to chapter Daniel's concerned. He's wondering, you know, how's my people's future going to end? Is it is it going to be what I just saw, where they're going to be a conquered people? And as he gets into the scriptures and he begins reading, he realizes God has a far bigger plan for things than he can truly comprehend. In fact, Daniel is reading chapter 29 of Jeremiah. You can look there today, particularly chapter or verses 10 through 14. And as he is making his way regularly through the scriptures on this particular day, and maybe morning, it doesn't say, as he is reading it, he comes across Jeremiah 29. And Jeremiah 29, God speaks there and says, look, I'm going to send Israel into captivity for their sins. And I'm going to leave them there for 70 years. But I'm not going to forget them. And at the end of that 70 years, I'm going to begin to return them to their land and start a new phase of life with this people of mine. Now, remember, Daniel comes to Babylon in about 605. We know right here, chapter 9, Darius comes to the throne in 539. Just do a little math and you can figure 66 years have passed. So Daniel realizes, I am close, we are close to the 70 years years. God's about to do something new. A little bit of note here to think about. Think about how you interact with the Word of God today. Because if we're honest, I think sometimes we reach for the map after we have really figure out we're lost. You know, sometimes we just think we know the answers, and we just know what to do, and we just go ahead and do things And sometimes we never really consult God about a lot of things in our life. And then we get into trouble, we're lost, we'll reach for the map. And sometimes, you know what, you can reach for the map then, and God in His grace and mercy will just help you see something that will help you out. You ever had that? I've had that. Grab the book, opened it up, and would just somehow end up in the right chapter, right place, and man, it would speak to my heart. We've had those. But listen, more often than not... The way God works to prepare us for what's coming that we can't see, we don't know, but He wants to do, more often than not, what makes us ready for those moments is regular time walking through His Word. And now listen, there's going to be a lot of times you're going to read the Bible and you're going to finish some time in it and you're going to think, that was great, but 
okay. I, I'm not really feeling a lot. It's okay. It's kind of like when you eat. You know, every day you eat. But you know what? Some days you're just full and it don't seem to do more than I'm full. And there it is. But you know what? You're getting nourishment. You're getting strength for things coming down the road you're going to need. It's the same way in the spiritual. And that's why we need this regular time in the Bible. And as we're in that regular time reading and and interacting with the Word of God, whether we recognize it or not, that's soaking into our minds, that's soaking into our hearts, and it has a way as we live every day of, of, of coming to mind, coming to our heart, and keeping us on track for the future. So can I encourage you, don't reach for the map when you're lost. Reach for the map before you're lost. It'll keep you from a lot of things and prepare you for things that you cannot even see. And by the way, something else to really take note of, because uh, we need to think about, what do I think this book is? And notice Daniel believed the scriptures were the word of the living God. He believes Jeremiah is more than just a man writing some words but it's the voice of God heard through a man. He believes the scriptures. And Daniel believes that in them, when I open them, I hear the voice of God. And listen, every time you open that book, you hear the voice of God. You do. Now, every time it may not hit you, and it may not be an eye-opening experience, and obviously it was not for Daniel. But on this particular day, it was. And he heard God speaking in a very unique way. By the way, this is in large part why we read about a faithful Daniel. Here, right here, is how you can live in your Babylon and not have Babylon live inside of you. Because you are living inside the Word of God. And that is living inside of you and it is shaping you and it is molding you and it is preparing you for what's to come we often want to listen there's not big secrets to faithfulness they're just hard things to do on a regular basis and one of them is following the map and that's what we see with Daniel now listen this morning all of us here this morning are following something or someone on our journey the question is, is it as solid and as certain as Daniel's was? So one of the things we need to think about and we need to be reminded of for our journey is we need to be following the map. We need to be reading the map. We need to be understanding the map and living in the map and letting it saturate our lives and our heart. Now, out of that comes a second thing, I think, that is a reminder for our journey. And I'm, gonna, I'm going to word it this way. I think some of us need to travel with what I will say. We need to travel lighter. Uh, depending on where you're going on a journey, there are things that you absolutely need. But probably more often than not, you know what happens we take a lot of things we don't need. We take a lot of things that we're not going to use. They are useless on our trips and journeys, and we don't need to carry them with us. When we get to chapter 9, verse 3, Daniel begins, as I will say, to lighten his load and that of his nation, so to speak. Look at verse 3. Daniel understands hey, the 70 years is about up. God is about ready to do a new thing. And he said, so I turned to the Lord God and I pleaded with him in prayer and petition, in fasting and in sackcloth. That just means clothing that is really itchy. It's, it's, it's clothing that makes you miserable. And they, they would wear it and they would just spew ashes on their head. It was a reminder and sign of mourning and deep grieving in their heart. 
Jeremiah 29, Daniel learns the 70 years are coming to a close. What you also read there, though, if you go there, is that he reminds them, look, I'm going to begin to work with you again as a people when we get to the close of this 70 years. But the starting point for that is going to be what Daniel is doing here, something called confession. And I want to just read a little bit of this. Just follow along with me. We won't cover the whole prayer. It's a long one, but it's worth reading. Uh, what he says, beginning verse 4, I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Lord, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and keeps his commandments, we have sinned and done wrong. We have been wicked and have rebelled. We have turned away from your commands and laws. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings, our princes, and our ancestors, and to all the people of the land. Verse 8. We and our kings and our princes and our ancestors are covered with shame. Lord, because we have sinned against you. The Lord our God is merciful and forgiving, even though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the Lord our God, or kept the laws that he gave us through his servants, the prophets. All Israel has transgressed your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. Verse 20, while I was speaking and praying, confessing my sin, and the sin of my people Israel, and making my request to the Lord my God for his holy hill. Daniel enters into two types of confession, corporate and individual. And by the way, there is a place for both of them. Sometimes as a people, together, we need to confess our sins to God. This is why, whether it is a church, a nation, or some other kind of entity, there are times we need to take a serious look at what our past has been like, how we have acted, and what we have done. Because sometimes, whether we recognize it or not, corporately, it is our sin, even from the past, that affects and stalls our present and our future. And we need to confess and we need to confess in a personal way. By the way, please notice, Daniel doesn't come to God and say, um, you know, God, we kind of didn't get it right. Kind of made a few mistakes. Okay, he just gets down to business. He calls it what it is. We have sinned. We have rebelled. We have done wickedly before you. And that is the way we must come to God. Okay? Let's just call our sins what they are. Let's call our wickedness what it is. And God will be merciful and gracious to that. Now, I do find it interesting. I don't know if you do. When we have read Daniel throughout this book, he's been incredibly faithful. And yet here is Daniel saying, I'm confessing my sin. What kind of sin did this guy have? You ever think about that? And I'm thinking, if that guy has sin, what kind of sin do I have? Because none of us probably are on the level of Daniel. But I, you know what this is? It's just a great reminder of what Paul says in the book of Romans. There's none righteous. Not a one. Is Daniel good? Oh, yeah, he is. Humanly speaking, he's great. Compared to God, huh, he comes up short like everyone does, and confession is needed. And that is just as true for all of us today. By the way, God, I find it interesting. Babylon was a wicked place, but God does not deal with their sins first. He deals with his people's sins first. By the way, that is exactly how God works. The, the New Testament tells us that judgment begins at the house of God. See, we think of sin as an out there thing. God starts and says, let's think about sin, but let's think about it as an in here 
thing. I want to think about it with my people, and I want you to think about it, what's going on inside your heart. Why? Why would God do that? Because you and I are the light of the world. Okay? They are in darkness. The world's in darkness. That shouldn't surprise us. The people of God should not they live that way. But sometimes we do. And sometimes we get just as infected with the sin. And so we need those moments of confection. By the way, when you read the Bible, almost, maybe not all the time, but almost, every time God gets ready to or wants to do a new thing, particularly with his people, it always starts with some time of heartfelt confession. Think about Old Testament Israel. Remember when God brought them out of slavery, heads them toward the promised land. They've seen miracles and everything. What do they do? Oh, they grumble. They complain. It's not good enough. God, I don't like that. I don't like the way you do that. I don't like the food you're given. God, like, okay, I've had enough of that. So I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. We're just going to walk around the circle for 40 years. And that's what they do. Now, does God take care of them? He does. He does. When that generation dies off and the new one's there, when you go to the book of Deuteronomy, that's where we're at. The second generation is standing, ready to walk into the new land. But before they do, they get a real quick course on sin. Go read 28, 29, 30, 31 of Deuteronomy. God talks in there about sin. And there's a time of confession before they step over. And God begins to open up the new land to them. When you come to the New Testament, Jesus comes on the scene. He is bringing a new kingdom with a new way of looking at things and living. And yet Matthew records the first words of Jesus. You know what the words are? Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. That's confession. When the disciples ask Jesus, the one thing they ask him is, hey, teach us to pray because when you pray, things happen. We want to pray and things happen. And a part of that prayer, do you remember what it is? Now, Jesus doesn't have to pay this part of the prayer, but it's amazing that he gives it to his people. It is, forgive us our sins or forgive us our debts, just as we forgive those who are sinned or indebted to us. Confession. Here's Daniel, standing at the threshold of something God is going to do new with the people. And where are they at? They're at confession. Because you've got to clear away the old to get to the new. Just a thought this morning. Some of us here, God may want to bring you into a new place in your life. But you know what? You may have to do a little confession first to clear away some of the stuff. And maybe even as a church, we need to think about that sometimes. Confession is good for the soul because it is sin, even our sin as the people of God. It keeps us sometimes from what he wants to do with us in our journey. Now, other times, there's the flip side to that, and that is this. We deal with our sins, we confess our sins, and then you know what we do? Once we're done, we just pick them back up and keep carrying them around. We keep carrying our shame and carrying our guilt, which we were supposed to have left back there where we confessed it. We just pick up our suitcases again, and they're still full of the same old stuff, and we have trouble making it on the journey. By the way, The writer of Hebrews spoke about this. Look at this verse here to put up. It's Hebrews 12 and verse 1. Notice what he says here. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, other people already made the journey. They've got there. What do you need to do? Throw off everything. Throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and run with perseverance. See, so both the things we're talking about. Some things are sin, you need to get rid of them, confess them, and other things are weights that have been dealt with and taken care of, and you're still hawking around that 100-pound thing, and you're going to have trouble making it on your journey. Can I ask you today? We'll put it in this vernacular. 
How's that spiritual suitcase you're carrying on your journey today? Are you carrying something in it that would be better left behind? Whether that is sin you haven't confessed or the sin you have, but you just still keep holding on to it. See, I love it. Daniel lightened the load for him and his people. Now, I wish that were the end of the sermon because that brings us to one of the most debated passages anywhere in the Bible, but we're going to deal with it a minute because I think out of it is a third thing that Daniel gives us for our journey. Uh, As Daniel is doing this act of confession, the Bible tells us beginning at verse 20 that an angel shows up in his room and he begins to speak to Daniel. And he reminds Daniel that, look, Daniel, you're only seeing a 70-year period, but God sent me to talk to you because God's got so much bigger of a plan for you and your people than you can even comprehend. And we come to something that is referred to usually as Daniel's 70 weeks. Uh, We're going to read it, and then we're going to try to walk through it a minute, okay? So we're going to pick up at verse 24. The angel says to Daniel, 77s, or that can be 70 weeks or weeks of years, are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, put an end to sin, atone for wickedness, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy place. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and 62 sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be put to death and he will have nothing. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end, and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven or one week. In the middle of that seven or week, he will put an end to sacrifice and offerings. At the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolations until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. All right. Yeah, we're going to try to walk through this. Uh, I'm under, again, I'm under no illusions today. I'm going to unpack it all. Um, we could spend weeks on this. But here's, we'll get to the big picture in a minute. But here's Daniel thinking about his people. He realizes 70 years is about up. He thinks, great, we're going back. Now, Does he have any idea what's going to be there when he gets there? No. He has no idea what's going to be there for his people when they get there or what will become of them. God, in his mercy, sends Gabriel to him to say, Daniel, God's got a plan for your people you can't even begin to imagine. And then he begins to unfurl that plan here. Uh, Notice it says 77s. That's in verse 24. That sevens there. It is a word that can mean week or weeks of years. So here, there's two ways to look at this passage. Give you both of them. Uh, You can decide. What do you think, Pastor? I'm not sure what I think, to tell you the truth. I I think, though, the big picture I'm going to give you is one of the answers to it. Okay? Uh, Some people see this uh, and and all of these mentions of, of times here as just God's way of symbolically saying after a very long time, God's going to do something great for Israel and God's going to take care of them. That's how they see it. Because seven in the Bible uh, is sometimes used as a number of completeness or wholeness. So the idea here would be that this isn't a specific time frame. It's just saying to us, listen, Over time, how much time? We don't know. But over a large time, God is going to complete all of his work for his people. That's what he's telling Daniel. 
Now, others are going to see that a little more specifically, and so we're going to try to walk through that. Uh, In fact, this is probably how most people, at least that I have read, understand it. Again, is it right? Well, I don't know, but it is interesting. I'll put it that way, and you'll maybe see why in a moment. Uh, How many days are in a week? Thank you. Seven. So, if a week, each day, each day would be a year, one week would equal seven years. You, know, you want to write all this down if you want to try to write it down because there's no slides. I'm sorry. So it says 77s are 70 sevens of years are decreed upon your people. So if we take 70, multiply it by seven, we get 490. Some people think what he's saying is, look, God has set out 490 years that he is going to work with the people of Israel and he is going to complete everything he wants to do in them. And he says here, when does the 70 or when does the 490 years start? He says from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. When when did that happen? Well, the problem is with that there's three different dates we can draw from history for when that actually happened. Uh, the date most people settle on is the day of 444 B.C. Uh, And the reason for that is because it seems to have more support from both history and Scripture. Remember in your Bible, there's a book called Nehemiah. If you go and read the book, Nehemiah returns with the people under the direction of the king in chapter 1. When he gets back, they begin to not just build the temple... They're building the walls, they're building the city, they're building their houses, they're building what it says right here in verse uh, 25, rebuilding the streets and the trenches, and in a time of trouble, if you go and read Nehemiah, it's a time of trouble. They're working uh, with one hand and holding a sword in the other, if you go and read the book. That's where a lot of people think that time frame falls. So let's say that's right, okay? Okay. He says, from the word to rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one comes. Who would that be? Most people think that's Jesus. Anointed is the word for Messiah. He says, until he comes, and look there in verse 26. He says, the anointed one will be put to death and have nothing. Well, that could be Jesus because he comes. He doesn't have anything. He's put to death and they have to borrow a tomb to bury him in. He says that will be a total of 69 weeks. So out of the 70, 69 of them will be covered by the time we get to Jesus and his death. Okay? Or we will have covered 483 years out of the 490. Are we confused enough? Okay. And here's the thing, and why people hold to this one probably more. If you do the math, and you take the date to restore Jerusalem, 444 B.C., add 483 years to it, accounting for differences in calendars, because our calendar was not theirs. Yes, it wasn't. It wasn't. They didn't have as many days in their year as we do. Then you deal with all the leap years that are there. Yeah. Here's where it comes out to. At the end of that, you come out either to the date of 30 A.D. or 33 A.D. Those dates maybe ought to ring a bell in your head because those are the two dates picked most likely for when Christ was put to death. One of those two, depending on how the calendar falls out. Now, if that is true, that says a lot about how amazingly specific God can be and work through time, if it's true. Now, there's 70 weeks. We've quickly covered 69, so where does the last one come in? Well, notice it says in verse 26, the people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end will come like a flood. And then verse 27, he, 
or confirm a covenant with many for one seven or one week. That There's that week. And in the middle of that week or seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and set up an abomination that causes desolation. There's two views on this. One is that it happened in 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed by a Roman general named Titus, and it was, and he did uh, desecrate the temple and set up an abomination in it. He did. Uh, others think that this is speaking of something that's still to come. We talked about this a couple weeks ago, the potential uh, individual coming that many people call the Antichrist. And he will make some kind of covenant with Israel because it doesn't take a lot today to look over in the Middle East and know that none of body can get along over there and they're constantly at each other's throats. And that is just a hot spot in the world and that reaches out all over the world. So some think this man will come, make some kind of peace over there, and then in the middle of that seven years, he will break it, and he will show himself for what he truly is. Okay, which is it? Maybe the first. Maybe the second. Maybe both. And I don't know for sure. And I'm not sure that anybody else does. Okay? Now, whichever... And however that works out, all of the detail of what God wants to do in those 490 years is summed up in verse 24. Go back and look at that for just a minute. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, put an end to sin, atone for wickedness, bring in everlasting righteousness. That certainly has not happened. And seal up vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy place. And that has not happened either. He says, look, here's the big picture. And, and interestingly, what's right here in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24 fits so good with Jeremiah 29 where he will say, look... I want to bless you. I have plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope and a future. Now, when we get to passages like this, we can miss the forest for the trees. And I don't think we should. I, 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 you can work with the details. If you want to talk about them, come see me in my office. We'll sit and have a fun time hashing them out. Okay, I love that stuff. But... What God at least wants Daniel to get is the big picture. And he wants you and I to get it too. And here's what I really think the big picture is right there. Here's what it is. It's the third point. It is the need to trust God to finish what he starts. See, what has been going on with Israel in their captivity in Babylon? There's probably a lot of them that were thinking, is this all there is? They didn't have the Bible, not like you and I do. They, they didn't carry scrolls around. They didn't have prophets going around in, in, in Babylon. They were there. And it's, it, it's all there is. Are we finished? Are we done? You know, God made all kinds of promises to our people. And look at where we're at. How is God going to do any of this? And the reminder here is to Daniel, and he will be able to share it with his people, is look, what God starts... God will finish, even if it doesn't look like he can finish it. By the way, sometimes our spiritual journeys are a lot like that. You can feel like you've come to a dead end. And you will get to points in your journey where things are not as clear as they used to be. And you feel lost. You feel stuck. There are seasons of incredible dryness in your journey with God. And God will seem distant. And God will seem anywhere but where you are. And the things of God will seem unappealing. And you will wonder, and you will, if you are all alone and this is going nowhere. Here is where you and I have got to see the forest instead of the trees. We've got to see the big picture instead of the moment. God finishes what he starts with nations and with individual people like you and me. And listen, sometimes God works in big stretches, in miles, and you can see it. 
And sometimes God moves in just little bitty inches, and you can't. But do you remember one of the big themes of Daniel? God is working even when you can't see him working. And what he reminds Daniel is, look, he's going to finish his work for Israel. What's that going to look like? I don't know. Totally. But I'm going to tell you, he will fulfill every one of those promises to those people in some way. And he will do the same for his people, the church. By the way, Paul tells us this very same thing in Philippians written to believers who were up against some hard times. Right as Paul begins the letter, chapter 1, verse 6, he says, being confident of this. Paul says, I'm confident of it. You need to be confident of it. That he who began a good work in you, you, is going to carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Listen. When God redeemed you, God didn't redeem you just to take you halfway. God redeemed you to get you all the way home. That's what God did. And God keeps his commitments. That's why the writer of Hebrews says to all of us, do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly Rewarded. By the way, that word confidence there means don't throw away your boldness. Don't throw away your faith. And by the way, the word, the way it's used there, means your public demonstration of it. He's telling them, look, don't go hide your faith. Isn't it amazing? When we read Daniel, he's not overbearing with his faith. He's not a pain with it. But he doesn't hide it. He will speak to the lowest or he will speak to the highest. And he will speak his faith. And he will speak truth. And you know why Daniel can do that? Because Daniel is a man that followed the map. Daniel is a man that lightened his load. And Daniel is a man who came to realize you can trust God to finish what he starts. So let's think about our journey this morning as we close. A couple things get us going. How are you using the map God's given you? Really? Really? Are you digging into it? Is it a part of your everyday life or do you jump on that just when things go wrong? Can I ask you this morning, is there something you need to lay aside? Listen, you may have hid your sin well. No sin is hidden from the Almighty. And you will have to deal with it. And by the way, did you notice what Daniel said about God? In verse 9, he said he is merciful and forgiving. Whatever your sin is, I can tell you this, if you bring it to God, on the other end of that will be a God who's merciful. You will find mercy. You will. And you will find forgiveness. And some of us, would you please unpack your spiritual suitcase today? Because some of you are carrying around guilt and shame And things that, they're gone. They're over. You can't fix them. God's going to take care of them. God's already taken care of some of them. Quit carrying them. Lighten your load. It'll help you. And by the way, have you forgotten? Church, God finishes what he starts. You can bank on that. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 24 says, Faithful is he who called you. He will also do it. Amen and amen. Amen. That is the word of God to us today. Father, we love you this morning. We praise you this morning. What a good, gracious, merciful, compassionate God you are who forgives our sins who forgives our transgressions, who allows us to lighten our load and leave our shame and guilt behind and step into new days, new life, new part of the journey. Father, I ask this morning that some of us here would experience the great mercy and goodness of God today by confessing our sins or by simply unloading our suitcases and leaving behind some things that we just keep carrying around 
that you have put away from yourself. And Father, some of us today, the journey's hard, and it is hard sometimes, and we cannot always see, and we don't always feel you working. But if Daniel's book teaches us anything, it's that God has always worked in the world. Father, may we be reminded today that what you have started with us, you will finish. You will get us home. All of your promises will be yes and amen to us, even if we can't see it or understand it just quite yet. Father, bless my brothers and sisters today. Restore their confidence. Bolster their faith. May we walk in trust and confidence. And like Daniel, faithful to a God who is faithful to us. May I pray that today in the name of our great God and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Some of our elders and their wives, if they wish to come, and Mark Therese, 
you have needs this morning, please feel free to come. Uh, God is always here to touch and help us. And church, can I just remind you this morning, God loves us in this incredible way. We are blessed with such a gracious and merciful Savior. Now, Father, we praise you. We, we honor you. We thank you for the privilege to be your people, to be cared for and watched over by a God who is committed to us and faithful to us, even in times when we know that we're not. And yet we can come and find forgiveness and a fresh start. Father, I pray today that as we step out into a new week, as we rub shoulders with people who maybe do not know you, may we be the aroma of life to them. May our words, may our actions reflect Jesus well. And may we have the privilege this week of sharing the hope in him with someone else. Bless your people. Keep them. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, have a great Sunday and a great week.